Hansen, uh, who roughly a week from now will be a graduate of our Merton program, talking about the research she has been doing relating car ownership and transportation to work. And with that, I will turn it over. Okay, thank you. Oh, and a remind a reminder, if you ask questions, push the button on the microphone so the people in webland can hear you. Because I know that a lot of people will be watching this on the archives. <laughs> Okay, happy last day of classes, everybody. Um, this is the result of my field area paper. It's kind of a com grew out of my job this year as a field interviewer with the Longitudinal Study of Adult Learning. And I was looking at how car usage affects certain employment outcomes, like whether or not somebody's employed, their average weekly wage, and how many weeks they work out of the year. Just to start off, I'll tell you a little bit about where the data come from. It's from the Longitudinal Study of Adult Learning. And that's based out of um, the linguistics, linguistics department here at PSU. Um, the focus of the study is on how adults learn in their adult lives. We, the, um, the respondents in the sample are people who did not receive their high school diploma or GED before 1998. So the focus is on people who didn't get to that level of education and what they do in their adult lives. Um, it's a longitudinal study, which means data are collected over a number of years. And the purpose of that is to be able to make comparisons and to look at change over time. Um, this year, between September and June, we've been conducting the fourth year of data analysis, and there'll be a fifth one in two more years. The way data col are collected are through in-home visits. There's kind of a combination of a sit-down, chat sort of interview process, and then the respondents take a skills test at the end. Um, there's a lot of information that's collected through this process. The data include information about education. Obviously, that's pretty much what the study is geared towards. But they also collect information about the person's employment history, their family situation, lots of different other variables. So you're probably all asking, OK, that's fascinating. What does this have to do with transportation? Um, there's one little question in the third wave of data collection that asks people what their primary mode of transportation is. And in working with the respondents this year and working with the data, it seemed like there was a really rare opportunity to look at some interesting personal variables in relationship to transportation. So you know, we have information on what the person's literacy proficiency is. We have information about the, all of their job history, about what their family life is like. And that seems like a unique opportunity because most transportation data sets don't really have that kind of information. So um, that was really my interest in doing a little bit of background research real, revealed a, really two issues. Um, the first issue kind of related to um, that I was looking at was the connection between car usage and employment outcomes. And this research really was sparked by um, the welfare to work, welfare reform and the welfare to work transition, looking at you know how does transportation play into people's ability to get a job and keep a job. Um, my little bit of re reference and um, research work revealed a couple of issues. One is that a lot of times people who don't have a car simply can't get a job. A lot of jobs look at a person's having a vehicle as a criteria for hiring them. Um, Another problem, whether a person has a car that's not dependable or they depend on transit, oftentimes that means that um, it's difficult for them to make sure they get to work on time and they get to work regularly. And so tardiness and absenteeism is a problem that confronts people trying to get a job. Um, finally, there are gender differences. Um, women seem to have a lot of extra responsibility in terms of taking kids to school and running errands and things like that. And so having the flexibility that a car provides really helps them out. Um, so the results of some of the research that has looked at this issue has found that a car can help people overcome kind of spatial barriers. They can get to where they want to go, when they want to get there. And um, they've also found that having a car improves job retention and wages for people. Um, but then there's other research that looks at car usage and car ownership and says, maybe that's not really what's going on. Um, one article talked about social networks, that what's really important for people move, trying to get a job, especially people who are move, making the transition from welfare to work, is um, having people they know to help them get a job. So those informal networks can really help make that connection. Um, the other thing is that um, 
it may not be transportation at all. A lot of the information we have that says that tardiness, absenteeism is a problem, and that transportation is the issue comes from employers. And one study that worked with women who were making that transition from welfare to work said, no, transportation isn't really the thing. It's just a socially acceptable excuse, meaning I have real things going on in my life, but I can't tell my employer what those things are. It could be a family situation. It could be drug abuse, whatever. And um, I say transportation or child care, and they seem to be OK with that. So I was kind of interested in looking at what the real effects of the car are, or what the real relationship is between car and employment outcomes, and also see if the LSAL data can provide kind of some context for these other issues like the social networks. So this led to a couple of research questions. The first one was, what is the relationship between car ownership and employment opportunities in this sample of non-high school grads? The second is, do other factors mediate the need for car ownership? So if we can look at literacy proficiency, if we can look at social networks, does that change the role the car plays for people in terms of what their employment is? And then finally, what are the differences between men and women? So just kind of give you a brief outline of how the presentation is going to go in the next few minutes. I'm going to start off talking a little bit more about the data sample and the LSAL, kind of profile the respondents and tell you a little bit about who they are. Then go through my research methodology, talk about some of the results, and then um, go over some conclusions. These are not our respondents. Um, <laughs> this is just a cheesy clip art picture, but there, there's no real way to generalize who our respondents are, so it's kind of difficult for me to say these are our respondents. Really, it seems to me that the only thing they have in common is that they didn't get a high school diploma, they didn't have a GED as of 1998. Um, to give you a little more context for how the people in the sample were chosen, um, they were people who, did, again, did not have their high school diploma or GED in 1998. They lived in Portland, so they lived either Clackamas, Washington, or Multnomah County. They were between the ages of 18 and 44, and they were English proficient, so they were able to communicate with a field interviewer. Um, the, the sample is pretty much evenly split between men and women. Um, as you'll see, these are not all low-income people. Although not having your high school diploma certainly can be an indicator for being low-income, it's not necessarily true. Um, in my experience as a field interviewer, my job is to actually go out into people's homes and collect this data, sit down with them, and ask them lots of questions. Um, I've had everything from meeting with a woman who never got her GED but is a successful saleswoman who makes $70,000 a year to a person who is scraping by a making minimum wage. Um, I've met with homeless people. Um, the sample really varies. There's every different kind of person. There's no way to really generalize who these people are. Um, that was back in 1998. Five years later, we're still collecting data. And um, the study has kept a 90% resp response rate, which is pretty phenomenal, especially when you consider this population. This group moves around a lot. Many of them don't have telephones. It's very difficult to keep track of them. And the way the study has kept this good response rate is having a pretty close personal relationship with them. Um, respondents get a phone call every three months. They're not always thrilled about it, but we check in with them and get their contact information. So the, we know that the data are pretty reliable because we have that constant contact with people. We're keeping people in the study. And so most of the people who started off in 1998 were still getting data from them now in 2003, and then we'll get the fifth year of data in 2005. So just to give kind of a little more context and more information quantitatively about who these people are, um, I'll give kind of some numbers for the LSAL respondents versus the census data, just to kind of give you an idea about how it's different. Um, minorities are overrepresented in this data group. Um, they represent about 34% of the study population. Um, the census Countywide, it's a more like 17%. Marital status is fairly even. It's about half in both um, the Portland area and in the LSAL. The median income of the LSAL is much lower. It's about $15,000 a year. And again, that's the median. Um, the range of LSAL yearly income comes in from $400 up to $200,000. There's a lot of variation in the sample. Um, Average household size is a little larger in the LSAL, which means that that household income gets stretched a little bit further for these people. Um, 
although the, all the people in the El Sal are not low income, if they do make up a pretty substantial portion, about 20% of the El Sal um, respondents are at or below poverty. Um, Portland-wide, it's more like 9%. And this, again, is for the year 2000. Pre-recession, things certainly could have changed, but this is what the picture looks like. And so um, the data that I'm using were collected during that school year of 99, 2000, or 2000, 2001, excuse me. Um, and so the census data is from 2000, so they're comparable. Um, we do have some welfare recipients. They're certainly not the majority of the study. Um, they make up about 5% of the study population. And then finally, um, about 16% of our respondents had received food or housing support in the last year. So that means they might have got Section 8, they might have received food stamps, emergency food aid, something like that. Okay, back to transportation. Um, the driving behavior, behavior of the LSAL sample. Um, the question in the data, again, was what is your primary mode of transportation? About 62% of the respondents drive their own vehicle. 6% um, drive somebody else's vehicle. 23% um, use public transportation. And then the rest use some other mode, which is probably biking, walking, something like that. Um, to give a little more context to this, men drive a little bit more than women. 65% um, of men in the survey drive their own car. 59% of women drive their own car. Um, in the first year of data collection, respondents were asked if they owned a vehicle. And um, in wave three, only 63% of the people who had owned a vehicle two years before that were driving, which means that maybe there's some fluctuation. Maybe they no longer have the car. Maybe they leave their car at home. Maybe the car no longer works, whatever. There's definitely some fluctuation there. And at the same time, 62% of the people who didn't have a car in wave one were driving in wave three. So it does suggest that this population kind of, their car usage is not um, steady. It certainly changes over time. Um, and finally, 72% of the people who are at or below po the poverty level um, were driving their own vehicle as their primary mode of transportation. So there's a lot of car use in the sample. Give you a little bit of employment information. 78.4% of our respondents were employed at the time of the interview. 14.4% of those respondents had had the same job since wave one. So they had the same job over three years. About 18% of them had had two or more jobs over three years, which suggests that there's a fair amount of turnover happening, that people aren't necessarily having steady employment. Um, the highest number, the range went up to eight jobs over three years. So there's definitely some variation there. This is a cross tabulation that shows um, people who are employed or not employed by what mode they use. Um, about 60% of the people who were employed drove their cars. 33% um, were employed but didn't drive. They used some other mode like transit, walking, whatever. Um, of the people who are not employed, more of them did not have, uh, were not driving a car. They were using some other mode. Okay, so now on for my research, what I was doing. I was interested in looking at how these different factors like car usage and literacy proficiency and social networks, how all of that played into certain employment outcomes. Um, I was looking at three different employment outcomes. The first one is whether or not somebody was employed. The second one was their average weekly wage. And the third was the weeks worked per year. And I ran these three models for the entire sample so that men and women could be compared to each other, and then for women only and men only to see if there were differences in gender. The reason I went with three different dependent variables is that they measure different things. Um, employed yes or no only means that the person had a job on the day that they were interviewed. So it doesn't give really a lot of context about how well they're doing with their work. Um, average weekly wage gives a little more of an idea of how successful they are at their job. And then weeks, per, weeks worked per year gives some sense of stability, how well they're doing over time or they're keeping up with their job. Um, for independent variables, these are the variables that are meant to kind of control those dependent variables. Um, included demographic variables, obviously, gender, age, whether or not the person had a young child under the age of two, and then minority status. 
and then the independent variables. Um, car is a primary mode of transportation was the first one. Whether or not the person had a high school diploma or GED was the second one. And because I was using data from the third wave of data collection, some respondents had actually earned their GED by that time, about 100 out of 900 respondents. The next measure was literacy score. And as part of the interview process, respondents take a standardized assessment that measures their literacy proficiency. And literacy proficiency is measured on a scale of 0 to 500. Um, the graph up there kind of shows generally over the United States where people um, fall in terms of their literacy level. Most people are a level three or below. And level one is kind of the lowest level of literacy proficiency, and five is the highest level of literacy proficiency. Um, to give a little bit of context to one through five, the table, I don't know how well you can see it, kind of describes some of the functionality that comes with each of those proficiency levels. So somebody who is performing at a level one level of literacy can sign their own name on a document. Um, they can usually locate information in an article and they would be able to locate the expiration date on a driver's license. Things they couldn't do, they probably wouldn't be able to locate an intersection on a map. Um, they wouldn't be able to identify background information to fill out some kind of application form. And they wouldn't be able to calculate total costs on an order form. So it kind of gives some idea of what level one proficiency is at. Um, Oregon has slightly higher level uh, levels of literacy than nationwide. You'll notice the graph shows that about 20% of people nationwide are at a level one literacy. It's more like 15% in Oregon, so we have slightly higher literacy here. Fewer people are at the bottom levels is what that means. Okay, and then the final issue is the social networks. You'll remember that I was saying that um, some articles have found that people's resources, the friends they have to help them out, is really an important factor determining what their <coughs> employment outcomes are. And I wanted to try to account for that, and there were questions in the data that allowed me to do that. I used a factor analysis to come up with a social network score. And basically that set kind of measures the amount of folks you have to help you out. Um, the questions in the data were basically getting at, do you have people to help you with things? Do you have people to give you time? Like, Will they help you out with childcare if you need it? Um, will they help you out with emotional support? Can they help you with transportation if your car breaks down or if you don't have a car? Um, helping you with money, daily chores, stuff like that. It sort of gets at, do you have people around you to help you just deal with problems? Um, and so that was the final independent variable that was included in the analysis. Um, so for the results. Um, what is the importance of the car? It actually ended up being very important in this sample. And again, this is, if you have a car as your primary mode of transportation, how does that affect the certain, the certain um, employment variables? Um, it improved the likelihood of being employed by 80%. So it's pretty substantial. People who owned a car were 80% more likely to be employed than people who were not using a car. Um, Car usage was also associated with higher wages to the tune of about $275 a week. So again, that was a um, pretty substantial relationship. And then finally, it amounted to more weeks worked per year, about um, 8.5 weeks out of the year. So um, this is consistent with the literature that's showing that cars really do have an impact for people, that it enable, gives them the flexibility they need to find a job, to maintain a job and earn higher wages, and to keep their job over a period of time and maintain steady employment. So that, those results were pretty much expected. What I was interested in is what happens when you include the other variables. What happens if you put literacy in there or social networks in there? Is car, the car less important when we account for some of those other factors? Um, before I get to that, a couple of other interesting things that are sort of off the topic, but um, that came up in the analysis. Women. Um, were making about $250 less per week than men in the sample, but they were working three more weeks out of the year. So women in the sample were working more, earning less. Um, people who had very young children were also working more, which suggests that there maybe is um, some kind of steadiness that happens as a result of that. 
Um, interesting findings as a result of minority status. Minority status um, was associated with being half as likely to be employed. So somebody who claimed minority status was half as likely to be employed as somebody who wasn't. But at the same time, it also meant an increase of $150 in earnings per week, which is a little curious. Um, it may be that once you account for somebody not being employed and you account for the GED and you account for um, literacy proficiency, that people of minority status were actually doing better in the survey. Um, not something I spent a lot of time on. My questions were focused on transportation, but it was an interesting finding. Okay, so the second research question got at, do literacy social networks mediate car ownership? So we know that car, the car is important, but does that change when we take into account these other factors? Um, it turns out, not really. The high school diploma, or the GED, didn't end up really having any effect. Um, it didn't change the explanatory power of the model. It didn't, exp it didn't um, change the effect that car ownership had. So there's no kind of overlap of explanation there. The car is independent from um, the high school diploma. In terms of the literacy score, that didn't explain away any of the car ownership. So that means that, um, again, those effects were separate. But it did have some substantial effects for people. Um, the effect, and again, remember that this is a large metric, so or small metric. So the, sc the score range was from zero to 500. And the results of the regression mean a one, in one point increase in literacy would mean however much increase in employment, weekly wages, et cetera. Um, so a one, a one point increase in literacy score does significantly improve a person's likelihood of being employed. Um, but it, again, it didn't vary by very much because it's only one point. And the difference between literacy levels is around like 100 points. So um, it, the one point doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, the literacy score also resulted in about 90 cents more earned per week. So what this is saying is if the high school diploma doesn't really have much of an effect, but the literacy score does have, a, have an effect, it means that for this sample, where pretty much everybody is at the same level of education on paper, the actual proficiency that you have does make a pretty big difference. If you have a higher level of you know, being able to fill out forms, do math, have better reading skills, that does actually mean better improvements for your employment outcomes. So that is significant. It means that even though the piece of paper isn't that important, your actual level of literacy proficiency does make a pretty big difference. Um, and that was also for weeks worked out of the year. Um, finally, social networks didn't have any effect in the model. It didn't mean that we explained more. It didn't change the role of the car. And so this would suggest that that idea that having people around to help you out gets you better employment outcomes wasn't really confirmed by this research. The final research question was, what are the gender differences? Um, turns out that the car had much more of an impact for men than it did for women. And this is, again, where each of the models ran, was run just for women and just for men. So can't really compare the results of men and women. We can just say that um, a man with a car was five more times likely to be employed. Therefore, it had more of an effect for men than for women because a, women, a woman with a car really was, wasn't doing any better than a woman without a car. I hope that's... It's not making any sense, but um, <laughs> so um, the car is having more impacts for men. Uh, men with a car were almost five times more likely to be employed than men without a car. So that's making a pretty big difference for them. Um, it also had a pretty big difference for weekly wage, but it had more of an effect for men than for women. Um, men who were using a car as their primary mode of transportation were making like $300 more per week than men without a car. For women, the differences weren't as substantial. Um, $123 a week is still a lot, but it wasn't the same effect as for men. Um, weeks worked. It also had a greater effect for men than for women. 
Um, ten weeks more for men, seven weeks more for women. Um, this might mean that women are more willing to use a different trans mode of transportation or they do better without a vehicle and men are more dependent on the vehicle. Um, definitely had much more substantial effects. Okay, in terms of having the certificate of the GED or the diploma, um, that only was significant for men. So men with a certificate were almost four times more likely to be employed than men without a certificate. But women who had their GED were not any more likely to be employed, didn't make any more money, didn't work any more than women without a GED. So that might suggest that there's some differences perhaps in occupational prestige, that the men in the sample are working at jobs where they're looking for the piece of paper, and the piece of paper is going to make a difference. With women in the sample, maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's not as important. And what we'll find is that actually the literacy score may be more important for them in that regard. Um, the impact of the literacy score varied a lot. Um, it improved women's likelihood of being employed by a little bit, and it improved women's weeks worked by a little bit too. Not very much, but remember again, we're only talking about a one point increase in literacy. So if someone rates one point higher on the literacy scale, it means that they're one percent more likely to be employed. Doesn't make a big difference at just the one point margins, but if you're looking at somebody really doing some studying and making gains in their literacy proficiency, it could have a lot of impact. For men, the impact of literacy was on wages. Um, they, if they were having higher levels of proficiency, it resulted in higher wages for them. So they were seeing the results of that in that way. Finally, just to kind of look overall at the models. I mean, the point of doing all this is to say, okay, does this combination of variables help us understand why people are employed? And the way to do that is to look at how much of variation it explains. Like, can we, does this help, how much does this help us understand? And so comparing each of the different models, if we look at employed, yes or no, what helps us understand if somebody's employed or not employed? The factors there are the demographic variables, whether or not somebody is driving a car, what their level of literacy proficiency is, whether or not they have a high school GED, and um, what their social networks are. What this shows is that that combination of factors helps us understand whether or not women are employed much more than men alone. So th that combination of factors is more important for them in their just getting the job. But for weekly wage, it's much more important for men than for women. So what that means is these combination of factors is having a different effect for the different genders. So for women, it's not really helping them get more money. The, the car, the re social resources, the literacy, that helps them get a job, but it's not doing much for them to actually improve their earning potential. Um, and the same is true with weeks work, there really wasn't a difference. That, group of variables pretty much evenly explained everything. Um, these aren't terribly high numbers. It means that there's a lot else going on. That car ownership helps us understand some of the picture. Um, literacy, social networks didn't help us understand it much better, but it did a little bit. But there's clearly a lot of other things going on. Okay, so just some discussion points, if I can get there. Okay. What this data show is that there really is a strong relationship between having access to a car and getting employment outcomes, and that confirms some existing research. That means if the person was driving a car as their primary mode of transportation, they were doing better. They were earning a lot more, they were working a lot more, and they were much more likely to be employed. And that, again, is a confirmation of what we already know from other research. At the same time, literacy and social networks didn't really appear to do very much. I mean, the, the, what really brought me to study this was to say, okay, we know that car makes a difference. Some authors have suggested that other things are really what's going on and that the car doesn't really explain it. So can we do a better job of understanding the problem? And the LSL data lets us do that because we've got information about literacy, we've got information about social networks. But this didn't really make a difference. The car was still important even when you take those other factors into consideration. So, um, yeah. and 
end of thought. The final thing is the car is much more important, but it was more important for men. And this is interesting, too, because other studies have found that car ownership is more important for women, that having that flexibility is more important because of the kinds of driving that women need to do. They run all around town taking kids to where they need to go, running errands, etc. And so other research has argued that women are the, those who really need the car. But this study, for this study, it was more important for men. It was having bigger impact for men, which means that women in the study, for whatever, whatever reason, are maybe doing better without the car, so it kind of... Balance, balances out the effects. Okay. So what are the implications of all of this? What does it mean? The first thing I think it shows is that the personal context is really important. Um, transportation studies don't usually go into the kind of detail that the LSAL does. We don't have information about people's family situations. We don't really understand um, who they have to help them out in a bad situation. We've got education data, but as these results show, education on paper can be very different than proficiency. And um, knowing that proficiency was really important for this kind of research. Um, so when we're looking at how to pe help people out with transportation, how to make the connection between trying to find a job and getting there, um, understanding the personal context, understanding what's going on with people more on an individual level can be really important. The next thing is to look for ways to integrate transportation and other services. Um, this shows that literacy proficiency is very important and having flexibility in your transportation and having access to a car is also very important. So looking for ways to integrate those things like having jobs programs that combine um, job seeking assistance and education to help learning and improve your literacy proficiency, all those things are kind of the whole picture. And it's important to get at all of those things because each one is independently important. And then finally, it's important to keep thinking about new options. Um, this, this data would suggest that having a car really helps you out, that having the flexibility to get where you want to go, when you want to get there, does make a big difference. So I don't know if that means that we buy everybody a car. I think what it shows is that there's definitely some flexibility there that helps people out. And that as transportation planners, we can keep thinking about ways to provide that kind of flexibility somehow. Whether it's through a car or whether it's some other way, um, it's important to keep an eye for how we can do a better job with that. And that's pretty much it. Um, I want to thank my two paper readers, Jennifer Dill and Claire Strawn, and the Field Area Paper Support Group. They were really great. They read my papers, and they looked over it, and they were really, really helpful. And um, now open for any questions that you may have. It is, and um, there, there is an article by Raphael Rice that they looked at that particular issue and they did two-stage least squares regression to sort out what's the effect. I mean, you know, if you are going to make more money and buy a car, then the way it'll show up in a study like this is, oh, you make more money when you have a car. Um, that research by Raphael and Rice was able to kind of sort that out, and they did find that car ownership was important for increasing earnings. My interest for this study was not so much to understand necessarily the particular effect of the car or to sort out the direction. What I was interested in is, okay, you know that the car has some effect, and there's lots of research that shows that the car has some effect, but people have a lot of other stuff going on in their lives that maybe isn't so well explained. And my real interest was in looking at do those things kind of take out any of the power of the car. So if car really shows up in all the studies as being really important. If you can account for your actual level of proficiency in literacy, if you can actually account for the people you have to help you out, does that change things? So I, I recognize that there's a problem there. You can't necessarily say that for the, these purposes that if somebody had a car, then they will make $300 more a week. What it does say is the car is doing something, and these other things aren't part of it, that it still stands alone. Irina? 
have a comment. Could you uh, return back, if possible, to the slide on the, your definition of social networks? Okay, because um, some of the literature suggests, uh, or some of the literature on social capital suggests that one should differentiate between social capital of support and social capital of leverage, with the support being pretty much what you've defined and leverage being uh, connected to professional circles that can help you move up. And basically what I think you have defined is the social cap capital of support, which does not move anybody up or may not mm -hmm. be moving anybody up, and that's kind of you know basically a comment. Yeah, well, one thing I was thinking, mm -hmm. one of the ways that I was thinking about it too is if you take a situation where somebody's car breaks down and they need to get to work, and they've been late too many times, and this is the time that if they don't make it to work, they're going to lose their job. Somebody who has a lot of that support that you're talking about, who has somebody who can give them a ride, or who maybe has an extra vehicle at home, or who has money to pay for a cab, they're going to be able to get to work. They'll probably be okay, and they can probably keep their job. Somebody who doesn't have those extra resources, who doesn't have that kind of flexibility, that's the person who's not going to keep their job, and that's responsible for some turnover. So um, it doesn't account for the leverage part, but I think it does kind of get at that, you know, do you have kind of something to provide a little bit of a buffer for crises because for some people that's not a crisis. Your car breaks down, you make it through. For other people that's a major crisis that means no more work and it's pretty substantial. Sean? I was just wondering if you did any spatial analysis to determine the effects of how far people have to commute on whether the variables that you looked at were impacted by that. I didn't. Um, there have been other studies that have looked at that I did not. Um, the respondents in the survey are fairly spread across the region at this point, and they were um, at the beginning of the study. I took out people who had moved out of Oregon, so that's not really a factor. Um, I know that would make a big difference, and that's just not part of what I looked at. Yeah. <laughs> Any ideas about why the effect of the car was so much greater for men? Um, the question was, why is the effect of the car so much greater for men? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I think maybe um, maybe women, if they're working closer to home, they don't have to kind of get across the vast difference, the vast spatial areas that men have to. I don't know. It, it's something to look into more, certainly. Other studies have been done on people. Your study was a specific subsection of the population who didn't have a GED and maybe are working certain types of jobs that may be more gender stratified, that may, like a lot of men might work construction jobs where they need a car for work or, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's certainly, that's certainly a factor. I mean, most of the other research that's looked at the effect of having a car, um, a lot of it's been on looking at welfare recipients and the transition from welfare to work. And so that might be a different dynamic than what's going on with this group. Sure. I'm just um, follow up on Aaron's question, is that the effect of car that's much greater for men, is that in line with other literature or in other regions? Is it Not really, no. Most of it's saying, from what I've seen, they're saying that the car usually is more important for women because of all this extra stuff they have to do. Yeah. I just would like to uh, ask how uh, the survey was tracking homeless people over the period of years, where they were found, and, and how was, how, could you? It's pretty amazing what they do. We have a detective as part of the study, like that's her whole job. And it, it's hard to keep track of 900 people who don't have phones, who move all the time. And so they, there's kind of this combination process. When we do actually get somebody and we interview them, um, we get lots of contact information. And if it's a person who kind of goes AWOL a lot, we get lots more contact information. So we have their family members' information, stuff like that. Then they check in every three months. Are you still there? Is all this information current? You said Bob is a good contact for you. Is that still true? Um, if we can't find the person after three months, 
then we send the detectives out and that's everything from going to their old address knocking on doors they sent me up to um, Linwood to try to track down this woman and her son her um, nephews and I'm just knocking on doors with strangers asking if they knew this woman asking if anybody else knew her do they know where she went trying to convince landlords to give information which they're not allowed to do and so it's really a pretty complicated process but they've done a really good job I mean keeping 90% of respondents like this in the survey is a big deal. The other piece is that we pay them to do the interview, and that probably helps too a little bit. Yeah. Hey, Carrie. Um, how much did your experience in doing the personal interviews kind of help shape your interests in this and what your research questions might be? It did. I mean, the, the, um, the part of the interview that we're doing this year Transportation obviously is not the focus, but this year they're actually asking a question. Um, they ask, what's your primary mode of transportation? Then they ask how you get to work, and then they ask how long it takes you to get to work, which would be a lot really interesting for a study like this. Um, it comes up, though. Respondents bring it up. I've had a couple people tell me, I'm on foot. I can't get a job. I can't get to where I need to go. It's, you know, my car broke down. There's a lot of stuff going on. And so... I would have loved to ask them a lot of questions, and it's just it doesn't kind of fit into the frame. But um, yeah, I found that it is a big deal for people, and people do talk about it. They acknowledge it. Trying to get rides, trying to deal with cars or other kinds of transportation are issues for them. Michael, I'm just wondering. Uh, you didn't. I don't think you listed your survey questions, but was there a question in the survey where you keep track of? how long the person's been at their present location, how long they've been in Portland, because it seems like that would inform a lot of the other factors, like the f kind of familiarity with transit system, whether they would have own a car or, you know, be registered. This is getting at um, how long people had lived where they're living, like lived in the Portland area. Exactly. And, also, and also, I think it points to, uh, which I think was a great factor that you brought up, that you brought into the study, which is the, the social network thing. Um, you know, depending how long you've been at your current address, you know, and especially this, the population that we're talking about, it seems like there might be a higher level of uh, transience. So um, was that something that was included or something that was factored in? It wasn't really. I think that it's standardized to a certain extent because these are all the same people who get interviewed every year. So they were all living in Portland back in 1997 when they first got a call saying, will you be part of the survey? And they might have left Portland might have left the Portland area, but they're back because for my study, I took out anybody who didn't live in Oregon. So all of those people have at least been living here or for some part of the time since 1997. Um, that said, those are really important issues, and the study has been looking at, since we do this kind of updating of contacts all the time and checking in with people every three months, we know exactly how many times they've moved. And some people have moved twice in one year, and sometimes people have moved eight in one year. And so looking at that as a variable would be interesting in the future, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very nice presentation. And um, I want to talk about the social implications part of it. W one could infer from your study and other studies that have come to similar conclusions that if your goal was to help um, <clears throat> low-educated people get a job, then and you were going to spend some public money to do it, then you might try and come up with a way to get them to own a set of wheels. And I know there are some states that have those programs. Um, in, in Oregon, if you look at the way, or especially in Portland, if you look at the way Metro, TriMet, City of Portland, Monoma County spend money, they seem to take the opposite approach. They under, deliberately underinvest in roads. They discourage car ownership, discourage driving, and spend billions of dollars on fixed rail um, to cater to choice users, that is, people who already own a car. So uh, what, what is your take on that? And, and if people at Metro came over here and asked you for your thoughts about how to spend scarce public dollars on transportation in the context of employment, what, what would you say? Well, I think that um, I think that clearly people who have a vehicle can get around a lot more e easily. It's a lot more flexible. But when you're looking at a population like this, especially that maybe is low income, car can be a mixed blessing. I mean, it does give you a lot of mobility, but at the same time, um, these cars are older, so it takes a lot of money to maintain them. Um, and, you know, to get 
somebody who's making $10,000 a year or less into a vehicle, it means probably an older vehicle. So maintenance considerations are a cost. Um, insurance fees are very expensive. Um, a study in Detroit found that a certain percentage of the population in Detroit wasn't driving even though they had a driver's license and it was because they, they just lost their car and their driving privileges because they couldn't afford to pay parking tickets. Like the, a lot of expenses incurred there. Um, so it's a mixed blessing. It can really be a burden for people as much as it can be a help. I think if I was to talk to somebody like at Metro or at TriMet, maybe the solution would be to start thinking more about flexible options. When Dan Marchand was here a couple weeks ago, he was talking about some van pooling options that they have, some other things that they've been doing to try to bring some of that flexibility in. And I think that keeping an, an eye out for looking for ways to make it more flexible, to maybe think about things like flex car or something like that that doesn't put undue burden on people when they're trying to find a job but does give them the flexibility that a car might provide is somewhere kind of getting towards an answer. Anything else? If it was a household, did you interview both um, if they were married or uh, just one person in the household? It's just, it's just one person. Um, there are a couple of situations where there's actually like a husband and wife or a mother and son who have ended up in the sample, but um, that's by accident. Everybody's um, interviewed individually. I was just asking that question because it, it would affect, I would think, if it was a married couple and you interviewed the woman and she, maybe she was working and the man was not, or vice versa, um, how, that, how would that affect um, your data? Yeah, and I, I should mention along those lines that I didn't do a great job of explaining how I define the people that I was studying, and I apologize for that. Um, I excluded people who weren't, working in or, look, who weren't living in Oregon. I also excluded people who weren't looking for work. The idea is that we want people who are active in the workforce for this kind of study. And so if um, I included people who weren't currently employed, I included people who had been out of work but who responded to a question by saying that they had spent time out of work looking for work, and I included people who had worked a certain number, number of weeks out of the year. So for that situation, if you have like a husband and wife team and the husband doesn't work and the wife does, he probably wouldn't have been included in the sample because he would have been weeded out if he's not active in the workforce. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.